morning, everybody, and thanks for having me here today. I'm sure some of you might be saying, gosh, what does a council member in the city of Sacramento care about oil and gas setbacks? And not only does my community care a lot about this, just on principle, but I grew up in Oildale in Kern County, and my most vivid memories growing up, um, actually my most vivid memory is uh, laying a chest down on a metal table in a doctor's office because I had spent the entire night um, struggling to breathe. My chest was aching um, from coughing and trying to get air into my lungs. And laying on that cold metal table was the first relief I really felt um, to those sore muscles. And it was right before I was taken to the hospital um, for the first time for um, my lack of ability to breathe. And at the time, it was so normal to us uh, that a lot of my student friends, um, a lot of my family, uh, that was just part of life. You know, this training you just ended up in urgent care or the emergency room. It was part of the rhythm that we got used to. We didn't realize that being surrounded by some of the largest oil fields in the state of California and the country um, was a direct contributor to that beyond the toxics that come off of the well itself. You know, all of the industrial activity that happens around these wells, the pumps, the diesel engines, the, the trucks. Um, I used to think it was so cool that the trucks would line up up the block from me to go get breakfast and they would just leave these trucks on idling while they went inside to get their biscuits and gravy before going out to the fields. It never occurred to me that the fact that those trucks were there was another reason that I was ending up in the hospital and unable to breathe every spring. So this is something that is incredibly um, has led to my fight, um, not just on as a Sacramento city elected, but as an advocate in the state capital, since we are this capital city um, for setbacks in California. Um, I was lucky enough to go back home last fall for a tour. Um, that tour led to the public health rulemaking going on right now at the state of California. And we were out on this tour hearing stories from parents um, and children who were still living near oil. I was lucky to, to leave when I did before the health impacts got more severe. Um, but some of these parents told stories about kids who were afraid to go to sleep because they knew that their friends went to sleep and didn't wake up again. You know, parents who've been asking for years, for eight years, for just a meeting because they didn't know what was happening, but they knew that since that well came up outside of their school playground, that more and more kids have been sick, more and more kids were having trouble paying attention in school. The community has been sounding the alarm on this issue for a decade. Um, and now the research is coming forward to substantiate what they said. Um, there is new research um, being done right now that is showing health impacts, sometimes as much as two kilometers away from a well. Um, this is an irrefutable evidence that pregnant women, that children, um, that elderly um, that are getting higher rates of cancer, are, are dying younger, are having learning disabilities. I mean, you name the difficulty, we've experienced it in Kern County, and that's continuing to get worse under the COVID pandemic. And now is the moment for us to act. We can't call ourselves a leader in California if we can't address something as basic as whether or not a child deserves to go to sleep in a room that doesn't have a well expelling toxic chemicals outside of their bedroom window. Um, this shouldn't be a question in a state that claims itself to be a leader on climate. So I'm thrilled today to be standing with elected officials to protect America and the over 300 members who have signed a letter calling on the governor to act. He has the power to act. He can act today if he wanted to. We shouldn't have to keep fighting this at the local level, at the state level, at the legislature, um, when it's something so urgent and so um, so obvious to those of us who've been in those communities. So thank you for, for having me here today. And uh, I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Council Member Select, uh, or elect, excuse me. Um, next up, we have Council uh, Commissioners, uh, Steve Picken, uh, uh, Steve Childs from Picken, uh, Colorado. Thank you, Christian. I'm glad to be here um, speaking today about what has happened here in Colorado. Our county has some natural gas in it, uh, just in one, one corner of the county in a remote area. So the, the gas issue has not affected people who live in my county, but in the neighboring county, for years, there have been gas wells being drilled right really close to homes. There were quite a few people having really serious health health issues. Um, you know, both things like breathing, nausea, headaches, which are common from the, the leakage from wells. Uh, most of the wells here are 
They use hydraulic fracturing, which people commonly know as fracking, to increase the, the amount of gas they can get from a well. Um, so there have been problems here in just the neighboring county to us for years. Also across the entire state, um, we are a very split state in terms of, we're a purple state with sort of equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats. And uh, we were always fighting over, you know, trying to get some reasonable gas, oil and gas drilling regulations. Uh, the issues centered mostly around uh, local control because there were counties and municipalities that wanted to be able to control the drilling within their boundaries but they were not allowed to by the state law. And the other issue had to do with setbacks from homes, schools, playgrounds, and whatnot. And so the setback has been 500 feet for, for many years until this year. Um, our Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment did a, a modeling study on the effects of health effects on people living within 500 feet of an oil or gas well and they documented that there were a lot of health effects of people living within that, or, you know, 500 feet away from the wells. Um, there were several, three different times, there's been citizens initiatives to try to take this to the voters of the state. Uh, two times in 2016 and again in 2020, our governor pulled the ballot the ballot issue off of the ballot uh, to try to do a more negotiated kind of a settlement. The one time the voters did vote for it was in 2018. Uh, it would have increased the setback from homes to 2,500 feet. And that measure was defeated 57 to 43% in 2018. Um, since 2018, our state legislature and the governorship have all been in the hands of Democrats. And so it was the first time in many years that the legislature could actually um, take steps to, to deal with the situation themselves. And then 2019, they passed a bill, Senate Bill 181, which uh, really put, put local control back into onto the table and actually gave municipalities and counties the ability to do, make the land use decisions uh, and regulation um, of oil and gas in their, in their jurisdictions. Um, it also set up a, a more, a better Colorado Oil and Gas Control Commission with more authority and that commission just this September voted to increase the setback from oil and gas wells to 2000 feet away from, from homes. And that was a final decision. They, they're changing quite a few different rules. It won't be until a few weeks from now that they're going to be meeting again and pass the whole package of changes to the regulations. But uh, right now the 2,000 foot setback is set to go into effect on January 1st. Uh, also, the, the local control will be back in the hands of counties and municipalities. Um, Colorado also has been very uh, much a leader in the country in terms of just controlling the, the fugitive methane gas leakage from wells, which there is a lot of a lot of that going on. Um, we really have improved the state of the technology just by forcing the, the drilling companies to use the, the best available technology when they're drilling wells. And that has helped prevent a lot of leakage of the gases from, from the wells. So um, Colorado is a leader in, in oil and gas regulation now across the country. Um, I hope that our example can be used as an example of what can be done in, in California. Definitely help to have both the House and the Senate in, the, in our state to be controlled by the Democrats because that's how they were able to
pass the meaningful legislation. So um, I'm, I'll be following very closely to see what happens in California and see if uh, you can get Gov Governor Newsom to uh, implement some better rules. And I'd be happy at any time to share information about what we have done in Colorado. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve, for that. Um, as Katie mentioned, you know, there's some 300 and uh, over 315 uh, local electors in California that has been working for the past couple of years to encourage the governor to take more aggressive uh, and more definitive action um, against climate change and, and against fossil, uh, to transition California away from fossil fuel uh, production. Um, our Carmen, uh, Mayor Pro Tempo uh, from Oxnard has been a leading voice in that effort. Uh, and I, although the governor hasn't taken the action that the, the local electors are calling for, um, Oxnard has uh, taken action and uh, I'd like for Carmen to kind of expound on, on that. And so uh, Carmen, would you please? You're on mute. I need that. Unmute. Okay. How's that? That's better. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Let me know if there's a problem with that. Anyway, um, it's just a pleasure and so important to be on this call with uh, my colleagues here. And congratulations to the new council member coming in in Sacramento, a wonderful town that I used to go to all the time when before the the um, pandemic. Um, my, uh, it, my background is I'm a, an attorney. I was a legal aid attorney for many, many years in our community. And when you're an attorney, you're focused on your individual client's needs, but pretty soon it's time to look at what are the, what's causing my individual client's problems, health in particular. Um, and I, a few years ago, um, really started noticing the impact on our low-income uh, farm worker immigrant community of uh, pollution and some efforts to really exploit our beautiful resource. What you see behind me, I hope you can see it, is Ormond Beach and the Channel Islands. And this is from our Tourist Bureau. And this is one of the greatest um, existing wetlands in Southern California that still exists, which used to have, you know, acres and acres. Now we have this and it's a huge uh, tourist and uh, educational scientific opportunity. But that was an area that was cited to be a um, liquefied natural gas terminal by one of the largest uh, mining companies in the world, Billiton, BHP Billiton. And we found out about it. Uh, and the community found out about it. And uh, at that time, the powers that be said, oh yeah, Oxnard is a great place for this. So that pipe was gonna, the, the terminal, which is like a football long, football field long um, ship will be sitting out there between those two islands you see, uh, potentially subject to earthquake and breaking. And the pipe would come ashore, would have come ashore through our very poor neighborhood and threaten all of us uh, including our public safety workers, our hospitals, our schools, our businesses, our homes. And our community rose up and said, oh, no, you don't. You're not going to shove this down us, down our throat. And we organized to stop the liquefied natural gas terminal. And that was in 2007. And despite the support of the governor at that time, um, the chambers of commerce, the people are going to make some money off it we opposed and were successful. So that's, that set our community off on a path of fighting for better health, for environmental justice, and for not being taken advantage of. And later on council, when I got elected to council, uh, we uh, opposed a gas-fired power plant on our coast, which had been there for a long time. Uh, and there was an effort to re redo it but our community, once again, now that we had the momentum and the community forces to tell our council, I would say with my leadership, I have to take credit for that. Uh, no, we want something better. And now what we have after a long, expensive struggle, 
we have a battery storage facility off the coast that's 100 megawatts that's going to replace that old obsolete technology using natural gas and uh, seawater to cool the process. So we're making progress in this community uh, that nobody thought could say or do anything. And that's what's happening now in our, in our county. Our county has, uh, in their general plan, before I am there, and before I had anything to do with it, has adopted a 2,500 foot setback from oil drilling because of the health consequences of oil drilling. Uh, and um, we know, as um, the commissioner said, what the health impact is. We know because of what the new council member said about health impact from oil drilling. And we just, we need better. And health is, should not be a partisan issue. The health of our children. Asthma is a horrible disease. My brother had it. There were times when he said, I can't breathe, I'm gonna die. Um, you know, if you have this in your family, or you know people have it, you know health is the most important thing. And that's what this is about. And it's also getting our community to be more modern. Let's use the technologies we have. Let's answer the call of our young people to address climate change. And we can do both by investing in new energy. And I think there's a lot of momentum for it. The people want it. The governor has shown leadership on this and I wanna see more. We all wanna see more. I will be the leader that California um, prides itself on, but let's, let's make it real. Let's not just have great ambitions, but let's make it real. Uh, change is hard, uh, but we can do it. As we say in Spanish, si se puede. Yes, we can. Well, awesome. Thank you, Carmen, for that. Um, I want to say just for the participants, for the media and the participants and the audience, uh, I didn't uh, say this at the beginning, but if you have any questions, please put your, put your questions uh, in the Q&A section um, of the uh, webinar and we'll get those answered. Uh, with that, though, we already have uh, a few questions been posed from the audience. Um, first, I'll turn this over to open to Katie and to Carmen. Um, Carmen, you mentioned that uh, Ventura Oxnard has been able to uh, establish a policy for 2,500 foot setbacks. Uh, I know the elected officials, uh, your organization, elected officials to protect California has been uh, pushing that uh, uh, or encouraging the governor to do that statewide. Um, and that the California legislation legislature had attempted to take up legislature about that to address the issue. Um, what's your thoughts on, on why the, that was not successful in being passed or, or why the governor hasn't taken it uh, upon himself to act uh, uh, under, the, under his executive power? Um, I would say that I don't really know where the governor stood on that. I know uh, just a couple of the supporters of the legislation and uh, we really ought to look at why, and why uh, it didn't get through. AB 345 was a, 20, a state rule for 2,500 foot setback. And I think we have to look at um, really where money comes into this for getting uh, legislators or local elected officials to vote really uh, not in favor of the people's health. And um, it's disappointing, but money still plays a huge part in how legislators decide. And I really hope that we, in the future, near future, uh, get shine a light on where the money comes from. You know, these the oil industry, um, God bless them and their workers. Um, the, the workers are concerned about their future. So they, and the oil industry is concerned about its future. But it's it's a last kind of a last gasp. And they put a lot of money into legislators who are going to vote no on this, and um, that happened certainly here. I think it's happening in Los Angeles, where the city of LA is looking at um, the the buffer or shutting down oil drilling. Culver City is a city we should all look to. Cal Culver City in California, um, which is you know it's it's on sort of West LA, and people consider it more affluent. They have a major oil field next to them. And that city council decided that 
They wanted a different future for their city and passed uh, legislation. And of course, it'll all be challenged, but we have to stand strong and say money, is, health is the most, most important thing and money to legislators. Uh, we should look at who's doing it. We should look at some organizations that are called AstroTurf that uh, pretend to be community-based but are really supported by uh, these industries to protect their shareholders, not the workers, the shareholders. And we just have to change that. Thank you. Yeah, and I will say, um, in addition to Car um, Supervisor Elect's points, which are very spot on, all three of the Democrats who voted against AB 345 had taken significant oil money. Um, I was there, you know, I was one of the names that Senator Hertzberg spat out of his mouth when he was making the argument against with the frontline community member. And the other dynamic here is, is labor, is the building trade specifically, because it's not all of labor. We've gotten great support from other labor unions. The problem is that the building trades are making this about whether or not they will have jobs. And as someone who grew up in Kern County, let me tell you, people have been getting laid off in the oil field for as, as long as I've been alive. This is not about California climate policy. This is about global oil prices. Um, this isn't a long-term employment plan um, for places like Kern County. What we need to be doing is diversifying that economy so that's not the only good job for somebody who wants to work with their hands and is in the trades. Um, these, a lot of these oil field workers aren't even unionized. And a lot like the union jobs in oil fields are actually very few and far between. Most of these are low-wage workers in incredibly dangerous work. Um, there's a story of a gentleman who was sucked underground and boiled to death, essentially, when things went wrong in a fracking um, incident. There's been explosions at some of these sites that have killed workers. Um, this isn't an ideal job, and you shouldn't be forced to choose between your children's health, your health, your family's health, your environmental health, and, and a good job. It shouldn't be that way. Um, the other resident who was on the call with me, who Senator Hertzberg also targeted with his comments, was an oil was a former oil field worker. Um, and he was there to testify about the fact that, you know, he left that job because he saw what was happening to his colleagues. He saw what was happening to the environment. And he didn't want that for his kids. So I think we need to provide a real alternative so that workers know we don't want, I mean, the same communities we're trying to protect. This is the part that I always try to explain to union folks and, and to trades folks, you know, they're not really listening to me. I'm like, you know, we, the, the workers live in the communities. We're both trying to serve the same population. Um, and the reality is that workers shouldn't be put into a situation where their health and their children's health are on the line um, to have a good job. That shouldn't be that way. And so why don't we push in that direction together for a vision of Kern County and regions like it that is sustainable. Um, one area, for example, oil field remediation. You know, nobody's talking about those jobs um, that could be plentiful and could really help communities and workers move forward together. So I'm hopeful for this year. I don't think the governor doesn't support setbacks. I just think he hasn't taken the steps um, to make it real. The fact that he announced the public health and safety rulemaking um, at Calgen was a huge win for us because he named setbacks as the reason. It was after those tours. It was after Secretary Crowfoot and Blumenfeld stood with us in Kern County, in LA County to see what was happening. So I am hopeful that it's not too late and that he hasn't made up his mind yet. But I'm not sure what it will take for us to help him make up his mind. So I guess this is also a call to him and his people to say, you know, what else do we need to show you? What other data do you need? What other evidence do we need to tell you? How many mothers need to hold their sick children and cry and talk to members of the administration to say, we need your help um, for you to actually take that step? Um, because we know that he's interested in it. We just are waiting to see what that might step might look like and hoping that it will happen soon. With that, uh, that brings up an interesting point that often uh, the discussion are around um, ending or transitioning away from fossil fuel dependent uh, economy to a renewable energy based economy uh, is the discussion of, of the economy and the loss of jobs. Um, however, it's my experience, it's not a whole lot of conversation around the impact on public health and that the that uh, fossil fuel production has. And so when individuals are, are faced with the question of do I, do I maintain a good or what I perceive as a good paying job uh, versus the cost of my health insurance, um, I don't see a lot of conversation around that. Why, why do you think that that hasn't been equated to or the cost of 
health insurance and the impact on, on individuals uh, health conditions hasn't been equated to uh, fossil fuel pollution uh, as a whole. Yeah, and I think that's that's a great question because like what was it worth? You know, my parents missed a lot of work taking care of me. You know, how much does it cost for that night that they stayed awake watching me take nebulizer treatments every two hours and wondering if it was time to take me to the emergency room or if they could wait till morning so that they could go to the doctor. I mean that those costs are um are hard to quantify. And I think that's part of like this What's frustrating about this argument is like it shouldn't be economics. Um, you know, I, I mean, we can make the cost argument, and that's what we're doing right now through the rulemaking and the way Calgem is like there is a real cost impact of these health impacts, and we need to start weighing that with the potential economic impacts. But I also understand what's very real for Kern County workers, which is that there isn't an alternative right now. You know, my aunt just got laid off from the oil industry last December. They like to clear their books before the end of the year. Um, happy holidays, here's your severance check. Um, and she hasn't been able to find another job. She's currently trying to figure out how to retire early because there is no other job for her in Kern County. And, and that's, so I get the real fear and it's, it is a real equation. You know, do I try it? Like, what's the point of saving money if I don't have a job? Um, and so like, that's the conversation we need to have is like, why is it that this economy and these workers are so isolated? What can the state be doing to establish pension guarantees, to establish, you know, universal basic income and for, for communities that are going to get, are being hit um, by this sort of economic failures of our state that's really left behind communities like Kern County. Um, and that's something we all agree on. And so, like, why can't we have that conversation? Um, our climate policy has no impact. Oil is going away in Kern County eventually. So why don't we do it thoughtfully? Why don't we really design what that looks like and protect health first and really take the steps to ensure those workers have those options available to them? Um, that, that's the conversation that I want to have with the building trades and with the legislature, not about whether or not we should, but how do we do it thoughtfully to ensure that workers and families don't get hurt um, in that process. And, and that's a real, that's what just transition is about, right? It's, it's not just about communities, it's about workers too. How do we make sure we're guaranteeing those benefits, we're guaranteeing that income so that they can really make the choice to move away from a career that's hurting them and their communities. Um, and I'd love to see the state of California do that. There was a proposal last year to tax to do wealth taxes and capital gains taxes and corporate tax loophole reforms that was put forward by SEIU California State Council that could have created a significant general fund boost so that we could have really had that conversation. And like that's that's the nut we have to crack in California. And I wish that was the way the conversation was framed. Not about what was worth more or less, because like that, I mean the equation is going to skew on the side of like saving a life is going to be worth more. Um, but like there is a real cost um, to to what we're trying to do economically that we need to really plan for um and i hope and i want to have that conversation <laughs> all right thank you um steve similarly uh, similar question um how uh, did colorado kind of deal with that question of the, of, of the balance between health and uh, public health and the economy well there definitely were health issues and that's why the Department of Public Health and Environment did the landmark study they did on the, the health effects from gas, uh, the different volatile chemicals leaking from the gas, oil and gas wells. Um, I, and I, I think that, you know, they picked the 2000 foot limit right now because the voters had rejected a 2500 foot limit. So it remains to be seen, you know, I'm sure there will be fewer health effects from the 2000 foot setback, but there are already a lot of oil and gas wells that are operating right next to homes within a few hundred feet of homes and of schools and of playgrounds. Also there's, you know, oil refining in the Denver area and one suburb of Denver is, uh, you know, one of their major industries. The air pollution there is is really bad, and they have a lot of health effects in in that neighborhood too, from just bad air that people are breathing all the time. I think it's interesting to note, uh, listening to uh, the, the discussion of the two people from California, we have a town near us that is right in the heart of the. The gas field in our neighboring county and it's also right 
next to the largest oil shale deposits in, I think, in the whole world. They say there's as much oil there as in the entirety of Saudi Arabia. All these industries, the oil shale and the gas industry, were are boom and bust cycles. And right now, with the gas prices being so low, there's virtually no drilling going on in this part of Colorado. Uh, a lot of people are out of work. Well, in the town of Rifle, uh, they had a, a mayor there who was very, had a lot of foresight. And years ago, he started developing solar electricity production. And Rifle right now has the highest per capita solar electricity production of any place in the United States. And this is in a little town right in the middle of the gas field in, in Garfield County, Colorado. I, I think that's very telling that they, you know, one elected official could see a way forward, uh, something that could provide jobs um, a clean from a clean energy production versus the the dirty the dirty production of other other energy things. Um, and also, it's interesting to note that one of the biggest solar arrays in in Rifle. It's located on a Superfund site where there used to be a Union Carbide plant that was processing uranium products. Uh, it's highly polluted with radioactive material. There's a big chain link fence around hundreds and hundreds of acres there. And right in the middle of that, they put this solar array that it's one that tracks the sun during the course of the day. Uh, so there are there are solutions on how we can deal with the health impacts by transitioning to clean energy versus the, the fossil fuel ones. Every, every one of the fossil fuel things has health impacts on, on the people who live in the area or the people who are the, the workers doing the extraction. Um, Supervisor like uh, Ramirez, um, with California being home to over 106,000 oil and gas wells, um, LA County, for instance, being a population of approximately a little over 12 million folks uh, with Inglewood oil field there uh, and its uh, association of proximity to Culver City. Do you think a county by county strategy uh, for getting setback regulations in place would be more promising than a statewide approach. You you know, sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly. It's a struggle everywhere. It'd be great to have uh, a state legislation that we could all it would be uniform. Um, I understand that there's possibly different concerns in different places, but the science is clear. And I uh, I think we, you know, it is a struggle when you have to do it. You know, there's so much right now, uh, as I said, the county has adopted the 2,500 foot um, uh, setback in the general plan. It's supposed to go in effect shortly. Uh, but right away, there was is a group of fighting against it, rate, collecting signatures to uh, overturn it. And money, I'm, I'm sure, is not coming from the worker. It's coming from the fossil fuel industry that have been really irresponsible about the liabilities they're leaving California taxpayers with to clean up, if we even have the money to clean up these wells, these are jobs, as uh, Katie was saying, these are jobs, remediation, cleanup, and of course, in the new new energy sources. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it takes political will. And if we had to do this in every county, it will be difficult because we, for a lot of the reasons that um, Katie mentioned, the, the lack of jobs, say, in Kern County. Actually, I know somebody in Kern County brags that this is the home of wind energy because of the mountains, the Tehachapis, et cetera. So we, we have to pivot. Uh, we have to look at, as Katie said, the cost benefit, you know, the health consequences, the, what it really costs to continue drilling and using and 
I think we just need something comprehensive. That's why I think I would really not like to see every county have to struggle for this. In our county, Ventura County, we have suffered from wildfires and terribly, as has Northern California. And I know, Katie, probably right there in uh, Sacramento, you were having to suck up all that smoke. Friends of mine in the Bay Area never had a clear day for days. Colorado, that's a situation too with wildfires in certain areas. Um, we're burning our we're burning our planet down, and there's just no doubt about what's doing it. So hey, let's get on the same page. Let's do the hard work. Let's invest our public and private money in better ways to fuel our homes, our cars, light our buildings. We can do it. Si se puede. We just have to have the political will to do it and lots of community organizing. That's what's worked in our county and that's what's worked in Culver City. I hope that's what works elsewhere. Thank you. Um, expounding on that a little bit, uh, given uh, Commissioner Child's example of how a local uh, elected leader in Colorado was able to recognize the opportunity to improve their job uh, opportunities for the uh, local constituents uh, and the economy. With the 2020 U.S. energy and employment showing that six, that uh, excuse me, that green energy jobs uh, have increased um, four to six percent uh, among union membership uh, compared to one to three percent across fossil fuels. Um, what more do you think needs to be done or should be done, um, say, from the government standpoint, from the, uh, the state administration standpoint, uh, to promote clean energy jobs? Well, I think, here you go. <laughs> I was, uh, that's exactly the point. Um, it's like, you know, if this was any other sector, I think we'd be standing shoulder to shoulder with labor in the oil fields pushing for something new. Um, it's just such an interesting dynamic that oil and the building trades have created um, on this issue. Um, even though workers are dying, even though they're losing their jobs, it's, it's still we're not working together um, versus in other places where you see, you know, Amazon workers standing shoulder to shoulder with frontline communities saying we want clean technology and better jobs. Um, so what I think needs to happen and what we've been pushing for in like the environmental justice movement space um, for a while is we want like these regional strategies. We can't talk about just transition in this sort of amorphous statewide level anymore. We need to get in to Ventura County, to LA County, to Kern County and really work out where are the, what are the classifications of workers that are here now? What are the potential areas of growth? What jobs do we need? And how do we pull together all of the resources the state does have through GOBIS, through tax incentives, through investment to ensure we're strategically moving that economy in that direction? And we've seen bits of it. Um, like when LA Metro went for zero emission buses, they contracted those buses from a manufacturing plant in Lancaster um, with a local hire agreement to say it's not just about doing it, it's about how we do it and where we do it. And so we know how, but what we're missing at the administration level is coordination. You know, the Labor Agency and Workforce Development Board working with Strategic Growth Council, working with Governor's uh, Business Office and, and iBank and the Treasurer to really make sure we're doing a vision that is grounded in what's going to work for the communities and the workers in these regions. Um, and that's something that folks like Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment in Kern County have started trying to work on through high road training partnerships with local building trades. How do we work together to bring in these new investments? But we could use a coordinated strategy from the top that is really grounded in what's going to work in each county and region in the state. Awesome. Carmen, your thoughts? Well, I think that it's important to look at where we invest our public resources and leverage that with private resources from groups that have pension funds, other, other kinds of assets to, you know, uh, what uh, the Commissioner Child said was very important. One elected official saw the future and apparently had enough influence to get everybody to go along with that. And that's what it takes. People who have a vision about the future. I'm not saying this is going to be easy, but it's, it's impossible when your community is fighting against you because of fear, because they don't know what the, the details are. One of my concerns is making sure that in these new jobs, 
that our disadvantaged communities are not left behind. In uh, our city, we are a low-income city. Uh, educational attainment is not very high, but I wanna work with our community colleges, our workforce development board, and our public uh, industry, public industries or you know, private, private corporations to get them to invest in the training and apprenticeships in union jobs. I do believe in unions. I believe that's the way to get back to a healthier middle class, um, but a healthier middle class investing in, in jobs that don't kill our future, uh, either environmentally or just individually in our health. So it's a strategy that needs community support. It needs leadership. It needs a vision. We can do this. We have to, we just can't wait till the, the hammer drops on us as it is dropping now with, uh, with climate change. We have to get ahead of it. We still have some time. We don't have forever. Got to do it now. Well, thank you, panelists. Uh, I think this is what we, all we have for today.